Right, so talking about unilateral upper motor neuron dysarthria, there's a fair bit of information in that title there. So unilateral, um, meaning the damage must occur from one side of the brain. So if there's damage bilaterally or down where it affects both sides, then obviously you're not going to get this dysarthria. And then the other part of it is that it is the upper motor neuron. So somewhere between the cortex, the motor cortex, or subcortically, or even brainstem, before the point of synapse, is where the damage lies. So if you have a patient where you know where the damage is, and you know there's not other old uh, damage on the opposite side, you already know what dysarthria you're going to get. So what can cause unilateral upper motor neuron dysarthria? Well, it's generally stroke somewhere along um, either cortically or subcortically or brainstem. It's damage in an area along there, but it can also be um, tumors perhaps um, and sometimes surgical damage or post-surgical. So what do we expect to see with unilateral upper motor neuron dysarthria? Well, as we know, most cranial nerves are innervated bilaterally, so the one side innervates both sides at once. I have another video that explains it in detail, so we're not going to go into it here. But it's important to remember that if there is damage on one side, it doesn't matter so much. You only get temporary or, or very slight weakness because the other side can take over. You know, they have this built-in backup, which is very handy, but there are some exceptions to that. So which cranial nerves are bilaterally innervated? Well, cranial nerve 5, completely bilaterally innervated. You don't have a stroke and, you know, have one side of your jaw hanging off or anything like that. Cranial nerve 7, it's bilaterally innervated in the upper part of the face, but it's not in the lower. So on the lower side, you don't have um, this branching off to the ipsilateral side. You only have unilateral innervation from the opposite side. Glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves are bilaterally innervated. So in theory, you shouldn't see dysphonia, and yet sometimes you do. So there are exceptions to that rule. But on the whole, um, you won't see unilateral impacts from single strokes or tumours. And cranial nerve 12 is bilaterally innervated except for um, the genior glossus muscle. And genior glossus is the muscle of protrusion. So based on this, if, if a patient has a stroke somewhere along the upper motor neuron on one side only, we know there's no other damage occurring or old uh, strokes or anything on the other side, what are we going to expect to see? Well, the only ones affected are the lower half of the face and the muscle of protrusion in the tongue. So what are we going to see? Well, respiration is going to be okay and phonation is going to be okay in general. Um, resonance is generally okay. What we're going to see is not so much the problems with the back of the tongue because they don't require a lot of protrusion, but the phonemes at the front. And in particular, the, probably the most sensitive one uh, is S. Because you need such a precise gap, otherwise English speakers notice that the S is slightly off. Also, the interdental sounds, because the tongue has to come forward to create these. Um, so, S... The incidentals, um, but you will also hear some imprecision with T. As for the facial weakness, it doesn't generally create a lot of problems because bilabials, uh, it's fairly easy to close your lips and then open them at the appropriate time, but you might see problems with um, F and V because you're needing the lips to move to the teeth and create, again, a precise sort of gap. So they might be slightly distorted as well. So let's have a listen to someone with unilateral upper motor neuron dysarthria. I have permission to use this video. Now this video is actually taken, Stacey took this to sort of convince the doctors that, she, that there was something more than just stress happening. Um, so she's literally mid-stroke in this video. You'll see from some other interviews with her, if you look her up on YouTube, that she did recover quite well and her speech is back to normal. So let's have a listen. April 2nd at 6.42. So can you hear the S is 
it's okay, but it seems effortful and it's the duration's off. It's a bit long. This sort of longer than it should be. April 2nd at 6.42. The second thing is that F on 6.42. It's distorted. April 2nd at 6.42. Just slightly off. So you're not going to see someone with a really severe dysarthria post a single stroke as a rule. But you just hear this where it's just, I mean, it's the quintessential slurred speech, isn't it? And the sensation is happening again. There's obvious facial weakness on the left there. The cheek's not uh, lifting as high. To the smile, they said. Around here. Smile. And yeah, her eyebrows it's are moving normally. It's all tingling on the left side. On the, on the left side. And you hear when she said on the left side, she's almost surprised that the TH didn't come out correctly. The interdental... Because she's using her normal motor plan to produce speech and yet the tongue's not behaving as it should. It's like if you, you know, you try to play soccer and, and the ball is four kilos heavier, every time you interact with the ball, it's not behaving normally. So we'll just listen to that bit again. Left side, it's all tingly on the left side, on the, on the left side. The doctor said to breathe in, breathe out, manage distress, and I'm trying. She says breathe in, breathe out. That th is a bit. The doctor weak. said to breathe in, breathe out, manage distress, and I'm trying. I don't know and why. The other one I didn't mention was an L. To me. It happened this morning again, and when I left the hospital Monday night at like 12:30 in the morning. So L in like. Again. And when I left the hospital Monday night at like 12.30. It's a very brief L. But if you listen to her posterior phonemes, g, k, etc., they're not that bad. In the morning. And if you skip forward. Thing. Stick my nose. She's having obvious upper limb weakness as well. Okay. So a few other things to note. Um, as far as DDKs, so diatocokinesis, so t t t t t t and p p p p p p p AMRs is going to be more difficult than k because k isn't requiring as much of the genioglossus to produce. But you probably see them slowed, but not terrible. Now, overall, because this dysarthria is fairly mild, it is difficult to tell it apart from a very early mild spastic dysarthria or mild flaccid or even ataxic dysarthria. Um, if it's quite early, there's not much to tell them apart, at least as far as articulation goes. The problem with this dysarthria is there's nothing that's super distinctive about it. It's just slight distortion of some sounds. Intelligibility is usually pretty good, like I think we could understand everything that Stacey said in that video. The really distinctive thing about unilateral upper motor neuron dysarthria is that you can see evidence of unilateral weakness of cranial nerves 7 and some of 12. So you'll, the tongue would deviate on protrusion. They're the biggest giveaway rather than the auditory. So you can see it's not just perceptual information and, and the sound of speech that we use to diagnose. We use the oromotor, we use the case history, all of that stuff. So if I had to try and give you some shortcuts, well, it's quite hard. There's really not one feature that nails it. You will get mild to moderate um, a laminal tongue tip distortion because of the impaired genioglossus. Um, so in particular, as we said, S... TH, T, and it's usually the voiceless sounds that are easy to pick up the distortion on. And maybe mild problems with uh, labiodentals. But the biggest giveaway is lower facial weakness. And tongue deviation.
which obviously result in these. So essentially, if you have a patient who has a stroke or a suspected stroke somewhere in the cerebrum, and you don't think there's other strokes, you don't think there's anything to cause bilateral damage, and they're not reporting progressive dysarthria, like it's quite sudden, I think you're pretty safe to say you're looking at upper motor neuron dysarthria. Hopefully that makes it a bit clearer in your mind. And check out the other videos for the other subtypes of dysarthria.